It's been 40 years since Paul Robeson last concertized in the Bay Area. 40 years ago, during Negro History Week, there was the concert at the Oakland Auditorium. And that is a concert I will never forget because there were these poor officers out there taking down license plates and all of that rain. I just pray to the good Lord that none of them got pneumonia. <laughs> I have been asked to say something by way of background for this program, uh, noting the 50th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And when you look back and think about it, there was no American more identified with the universal human rights than Paul Robeson. And it is fitting, therefore, that in the 50th anniversary of the issuance of the Universal Declaration, held in the centennial of Paul Robeson's birth, that a program commemorate his role in the struggle for universal human rights. Paul Robeson was born April the 9th, 1898, three years after the death of Frederick Douglass, and in the same year that Booker T. Washington, 1895, made his Atlanta Exposition speech. Two years after Du Bois was awarded the PhD from Harvard, two years after the United States Supreme Court decided Plessy versus Ferguson, And in the same year that the Spanish-American War ushered in a new racism and a new American imperialism, these events influenced and shaped the lives of all black Americans, including Paul Robeson. Um, Paul Robeson first manifested an interest in universal human rights in 1937, when he became one of the co-founders of the Council on Af the Committee on African Affairs, the Council on African Affairs, and for some 18 or more years, he served as its executive director, or its chairman, and he also was a major contributor to the work of the uh, council. It was in 1937 that he went to Spain and saying in opposition to racism and fascism there. As the years evolved, you could see his interest in universal human rights. And that interest was reflected in his music. In 1943, when Morehouse College bestowed upon him an honorary degree, the president said, Benjamin E. May said, you have the courage to dignify and popularize the folk songs composed by the oppressed peoples of the earth. Your singing is a declaration of faith. You sing as if God Almighty had sent you into the world to advocate the cause of the common man in song. All you need to do is listen to the songs of freedom, the song out of the Warsaw Ghetto, Kevin Barry, and you, the songs of the Russians during the Great War, and you will find expressed in that a great support for universal human rights for all people. In 1939, Robeson returned to live and become active in the United States. As an activist in the United States, he linked the black liberation struggle to the struggles of all oppressed people worldwide. He had the world vision of the struggle for human rights in this country. And in that struggle, 
he eventually became a great contributor to the campaign against genocide. That was a petition circulated and presented to the United Nations in 1951 charging genocide against the government of the United States. And Robeson was very active in that. Now, the final thing that I want to say is some assessment of Paul Robeson that I picked up from the autobiography of John Johnson, the owner and publisher of Jet Ebony and the Johnson Publications. He said, or he wrote in his biography, that some years ago, he was invited to the home of Earl Dickerson in Chicago to meet Paul Robeson at a party. And before Paul Robeson was introduced, he was thinking to himself, Paul Robeson, you are a world figure, Phi Beta Kappa, all-American athlete, singer, actor, scholar. Why doesn't he simply enjoy his success and live a quiet life? And I'm going to read exactly what John Johnson wrote in his book. As if to answer his unspoken question, Robeson told us that no black would ever be truly free until all blacks were free. Although he was a celebrated figure, he never went any place as Paul Robeson that he could not go as a black man. I've uh, chosen to devote my few minutes to uh, discussing my contacts with Paul Robeson. Uh, they were memorable. Of course, I knew of his genius and sought out the opportunity to hear him and see him perform. Occasionally, we did meet. I shall not forget his kind words concerning my work. I recall an amusing episode. Sometime, probably in the early 1950s, I was visiting at the home of my dear friend, Lloyd L. Brown. We helped edit the radical monthly magazine, Masses and Mainstream. Robeson, Brown's close friend, appeared as a guest. When he entered Lloyd's apartment and brightened it with his inimitable charm, Lloyd's four-year-old Bonnie greeted him, strained her neck, and announced, my daddy is as big as you are. <laughs> Lloyd was about and is about five foot six or seven. <laughs> Still, with a child's wisdom, she spoke the truth. Robeson lifted her in his great arms and embracing Lloyd announced, of course you are right. Lloyd, by the way, is the author of a recently published splendid book called The Young Robeson, which I recommend to you. Occasionally, Paul Robeson would ask my opinion in a circumstance involving his own life. Thus, sometimes, late in the 1940s, I think, the well-known DuBose Hayward had a play entitled Let My People Go in early production 
the theme of the play was the conspiracy led by Denmark VC in 1822 in South Carolina for a slave insurrection. I read this play and found it quite disappointing. It did not do justice to VC's comrades in particular. It omitted the very significant fact that four white working men went to prison because they favored Denmark Vesey. Further, the gigantic scope of this conspiracy was not shown in the script. There were other failings. Robeson did not appear. Robeson was, of course, not only a superb artist, he also was politically deeply involved. Thus, to cite one example, in the recent celebration of Jackie Robinson's entry into the big league baseball, this was presented as simply a decision on the part of the owners of the club. The fact is, and I know this from personal experience as a youngster going around with petitions, that there was a massive public campaign for years to break the racism scandalizing the big leagues. In the final phase of that successful effort, Paul Robeson and his close friend, William L. Patterson, were very active. Both, for example, met face to face with Branch Rickey, the owner of the Dodger baseball team, and demanded an end to Jim Crow. I want to say a word about William L. Patterson, whom I knew very well and loved, and is now gone. Pat was a central figure in the struggle against racism from the 1930s to the Angelo Herndon and Southern case, the Scottsboro case, to the Angela Davis struggle decades later. His book, We Charge Genocide, appearing in the 1950s, was an important contribution to the battle for black liberation. He suffered imprisonment He suffered imprisonment, but now he suffers being forgotten. There should be a major biography of that sterling character, William L. Patterson. I was associated with Robeson in the Council on African Affairs, an important force opposing Washington's disgraceful practice of supporting the viciously racist South African regime. Robeson's charm at our meetings and his knowledge of what had to be done always impressed all of us. We had bitter struggles to save the council after Max Jurgen, the council's chairman, with the State Department, had tried to swerve it from its anti-imperialist stance. The struggle at the time was successful. Later, the council, along with many other progressive entities, was killed due to the efforts of the McCarthy, Edgar Hoover, McCarran trio. The council's splendid secretary was Dr. Alpheus Hunton. Alpheus was imprisoned for refusing to be an informer, as to McCarthy's list that McCarthy wanted. On a few, fortunately few occasions, I had the experience of speaking publicly following the appearance of Paul Robeson. 
Thus, I recall an occasion shortly after the war when the Southern Negro Youth Congress, by the way, we called it SNCC also, was holding its annual recruiting meeting in Columbia, South Carolina. The hall was jammed, and seating was indiscriminate and illegal. I was present when the sheriff argued about this with the meeting's leaders, James E. Jackson, who is living, and Louis Burnham, who isn't. But he finally yielded and permitted the mixed meeting to be held. On that momentous occasion, Dr. Du Bois had been presented with a scroll reflecting the esteem felt for him by youth. And after Robeson had sung and spoken, I was called upon. <laughs> to offer words of wisdom and encouragement. I don't know what fearful enemy of mine had arranged this, <laughs> but it was not one of the most comfortable moments of my life. Noteworthy was the courage Paul Robeson displayed as an outstanding African-American personality condemning the barbarism of Jim Crow. Once in Savannah, Georgia, at a public meeting in a church, when Robeson was featured, a group of, 30 or f of three or four cars careened to the door, and some four or five armed white men in each vehicle jumped out. Sitting in the porch, at the church, however, was a group of at least as many black men, all well armed. The Ku Kluxes hesitated. The men on the porch called to them, come right on, come right in. It's a public meeting. The officers thought better of this, the cl Kluxes, might as well be officers. The Kluxes <laughs> thought well of this and left. This was the kind of struggle, it was the kind of country in which Robeson performed and battled and from which he was for years exiled. What a scandal. Let me, however, close on an optimistic note. The government which in 1951 sought, unsuccessfully, thank God, to send Dr. Du Bois to prison as, quoting the indictment, an unregistered foreign agent In 1996, graced one of its postage stamps with a portrait of Du Bois. I imagine he was smiling up in heaven as people went to the post office to buy that stamp. When will such official honors come to Paul Robeson, marvelously gifted battler for human dignity? In any case, the struggle continues. Thank you. Good afternoon. <clears throat> I kind of feel like uh, Herbert Aptheker following Paul Robeson. <laughs> I don't have any uh, personal stories of Robeson to tell you. I, I do know Herbert Aptheker and Ann Ginger, though, and I want you to know what a privilege it is uh, to be on a panel with them. Uh, since I see a few people younger than me in the audience, I want to spend just a few minutes uh, 
uh, discussing Robeson as a historical figure and then talk about the, the petitions and the impact uh, internationally of the movement to internationalize the racial struggle in, in the United States. Uh, I'm aware that there are a number of you out there who know more about ropes than I do, so I'll, I'll be brief uh, with this. But I think we'd be remiss without um, uh, at least commenting again on what a, what a remarkable historical figure he is. And I think the reason it's necessary to do this is because uh, at a school like UC Berkeley, uh, when I mention Paul Robeson in a class uh, I, and look out, there is a definite look of non-recognition. Who are you talking about? Um, so if that's happening with some of the best students uh, that we have, then I think it's incumbent upon us to, to uh, continually let them know what their legacy is. Um, uh, I'll, many of you know uh, his remarkable accomplishments as a, as a student and an athlete. Um, born in Princeton, New Jersey, um, not having the uh, opportunity to go to Princeton, kept out by Woodrow Wilson, uh, then at the last minute taking a, um, a statewide scholarship test and scoring uh, at the top, which gave him a fellowship to go to Rutgers, where he won uh, 15 varsity letters and became an All-American in football, although, of course, he was removed from the College Football Hall of Fame uh, later on because of his uh, political activity. Um, also uh, going to Columbia, uh, graduating from law school there, going to uh, Wall Street as a lawyer but being put in the back rooms because they didn't want him uh, facing uh, clients. Um, learning some uh, 26, 28 languages, uh, et cetera. A, a truly remarkable, I, I have to stop myself because uh, I'll uh, spend all of my time talking about ropes and the historical figure. Uh, but nonetheless, someone we should all uh, be aware of and be aware of their accomplishments. Um, in particular, I think we should be aware of his role in bringing cultural nationalism to the black masses. Now, Garvey is given credit, due credit, I think, in bringing black nationalism uh, in a political and economic sense uh, to the black masses, quite a a jump from 19th century black nationalism of a, of a David Walker, of a Henry Highland Garnett, of a Martin Delaney, uh, which was much more elitist. Uh, but it's Paul Robeson who brings them a knowledge of Africa and a knowledge of cultural nationalism. And he brings it through music, but he brings it through a lot of other things. In 1925, he gave the first concert devoted to the spirituals and work songs in the United States. Um, and of course he was drawn into music in the theater because he was shut off from practice, practicing a profession as, as a lawyer. Um, and in 1937, uh, we have heard he was a founder of the Council on African Affairs, initially the International Council on African Affairs, which was a leader in the anti-colonialist struggle in the United States. Um, finally, uh, he goes beyond Garvey in that he doesn't get caught up in kind of racial purity that the late Garvey uh, gets caught up in. Robeson looks to see our links with masses worldwide. And of course he does that, first of all, through world folk music, showing the similarities in the culture of folk people uh, in Russia, in China, uh, in Europe, uh, across the globe. Uh, and he once again takes this uh, to the masses, uh, not to the elites. So a remarkable figure in uh, American history. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the UN petitions, in particular uh, uh, the one Robeson launches, but two before them. Um, and I'm doing it because I really like to contrast it to the lack of domestic concern about, um, and, uh, about international human rights documents and covenants today. Uh, of course, we can go back to the, the League of Nations and the absence of um, any discussion of race or anti-colonialism in the League. That's not for one of trying. The Japanese tried at the founding meeting of the League of Nations as, as the only real uh, powerful nation of color at that time to insert language in the League of Nations charter that would uh, speak to the racial equality of all human beings. Uh, Woodrow Wilson and other uh, allies prevented that language from being in the League Charter. 
um, after World War II, actually before the war was over, uh, China, as the only nation of color involved in the early meetings leading up to the UN Charter, namely the Dunbarton Oaks Conference, but some other more informal meetings, uh, was concerned about the lack of any call for racial equality, and once again, tried to insert some very basic and general language talking about respect for the equality of all nations and the respect for the equality of all races. Uh, that language was once again uh, omitted uh, due to the work of uh, the United States, Great Britain, and the Soviet Union. Um, so race in the UN Charter, race internationally, has had a, a rather difficult struggle. Uh, in fact, we would have very little, I think, in the way of human rights discussed in the UN Charter had it not been for domestic pressure, uh, probably starting mostly with the Atlantic Charter, which I think helped trigger it. That is, let's not just talk about the colonies of the Axis powers, let's talk about what's going to happen after the war with Britain and France's and other ally, ally colonies. Um, and the organization of uh, large numbers of groups uh, across the country to put pressure on the United States to come to San Francisco with anti-colonialism and human rights as a part of what they wanted to see in this international document. Uh, some 42 organizations are accredited uh, to come to San Francisco, and of course, uh, Du Bois is one of the three, along with Walter White and Mary McLeod Bethune, who are principal uh, domestic lobbyists for this language. And as a result, I think, of their pressure, uh, we have in the UN Charter some very basic language about human rights. Um, there's also, of course, a push to include in the UN Charter an International Bill of Rights. And much like our own domestic debate over human rights, I mean, over rights in the United States, uh, the Bill of Rights didn't make it in the original. It's attached as a separate document. So we get an international bill of human rights, and we get the creation of uh, the Universal Declaration and a Human Rights Commission. Um, those people who pressured then for the inclusion of human rights language in the UN Charter didn't go away. They wanted it there for a reason. They wanted it there so they had an avenue of redress for domestic concerns. And that starts in 1946 with a National Negro Congress petition to the United Nations. Um, it's entitled, A Petition to the UN on Behalf of 13 Million Oppressed Negro Citizens of the United States. And let me just read in the letters conveying this petition, which was about 13 or 14 pages, what Max Juergen, the president of the National Negro Congress, which was 10 years old at the time, uh, had to say uh, in, in a letter to the um, Secretary General of the United Nations, Trig V. Lee, he says, it is with an expression of profound regret that we, a selection of the Negro people, a section of the Negro people, having failed to find relief from oppression through constitutional appeal, find ourselves forced to bring this vital issue, which we have sought for almost a century since emancipation to solve within the boundary of our country to the attention of this historic body, and to request that you, as Director General, place it for consideration before the Economic and Social Council or that body which in your understanding it may belong. Then there's another letter signed by Jurgen and Rebels Caton, the Executive Secretary of the, in, in, uh, the National Negro Council, to Harry Truman. This is a historic moment in the life of the nation. Vast internal and social upheavals confront us. Added to those, the traditional pre-war policy of racial oppression carried out by powerful forces in this country is now being inhumanly reflected more than ever before. The Negro people had hoped that out of the war there would come an extension of democratic rights and liberties, so heroically fought for um, by all oppressed people. Your administration, however, has reversed the democratic program of the Roosevelt government, both internally and in relation to foreign policy. Great burdens have been forced upon the shoulders of the Negro people. Negro citizens find the present conditions intolerable and are therefore presenting their appeal to the highest court of mankind, the United Nations. 
The National Negro Congress and Convention assembled feels impelled to send you the information which motivates this historic petition. The information uh, for that petition was largely collected by one Herbert Apthecker. Um, The National uh, Negro Congress petition, there was an attempt to get five million signatures across the uh, country. They were successful in getting a good deal of support and a good deal of press attention uh, to that document. Uh, in particular, they had an impact, I think, on the NAACP. Um, and the NAACP, which had welcomed back, at least for a short time, W.E.B. Du Bois to its fold, decided that this wasn't a bad idea, using this new international body to give uh, a worldwide expression of uh, the grievances of um, black Americans. So Du Bois uh, put together a much more ambitious uh, um, petition, drawing on uh, five or six uh, scholars, uh, much more legalistic than the first petition, but launched a major appeal uh, for endorsement. And I want to give you some idea of the range of groups endorsing the, um, the petition called An Appeal to the World. Hundreds of African American organizations endorsed the petitions, including the National Negro uh, Council, the Council on African Affairs, the National Baptist Convention, the National Fraternal Council of Negro Churches, the Urban League, the National Association of Colored Women, the CIO, um, and the American Federation of Labor uh, agreed to help the National Medical Association, the National Negro Publishers Association, the National Bar Association, the Southern Negro Youth Congress, Black Fraternities and Sororities, Adam Clayton Powell, Senator Arthur Capper, Mary McLeod Bethune, and international support from the Trades Unions Congress of Jamaica, Jomo Kenyatta, the Caribbean Labor Congress, the Kenyan African Union, Anatomy Azikwe, the National Council of Nigeria and the Cameroons, Kwame Nkrumah from the West African National Secretariat, the Nyasaland African Congress, uh, and Liberia. Um, news of the petition was widely reported in both the colonial press and the socialist uh, press. Um, the um, petition, despite all of this support, uh, didn't receive a warm response uh, at the newly formed uh, UN Human Rights Con uh, Commission. Um, Eleanor Roosevelt had some real problems with it. Eleanor Roosevelt felt that we shouldn't be taking uh, a nation's racial problems and discussing them before an international body, that other countries that did so would, were reprehensible. Um, and that um, serious consideration of the petition might frustrate the efforts to get consensus on a universal declaration of human rights. Uh, she might have been correct in that response uh, to the petition. Um, nonetheless, um, despite the fact that the petition uh, was buried, and Du Bois talks very eloquently about burying the petition in the Subcommission on uh, Minorities, um, it had an impact as well. Uh, it had an impact, I think, uh, on Truman and the Truman administration. Uh, in 46, Truman had conv uh, convened a presidential commission on human rights. I mean, I'm sorry, on civil rights. And um, in 47, they issued uh, uh, a pioneering report to secure these rights. Uh, really the first presidential report on race relations. And here's what part of the report says. Uh, it's talking about how embarrassed the United States is internationally uh, due to racial discrimination in the United States, it being the leader of the free world. Uh, in a letter to the Fair Employment Practice Committee on May 8, 1946, the Honorable Dean Acheson, then Acting Secretary of State, stated that the existence of discrimination against minority groups in this country has an adverse effect on our relations with other countries. We are reminded over and over by some foreign newspapers and their spokesmen that our treatment of various minorities leaves much to be desired. While sometimes these pronouncements are exaggerated and unjustified, they all too frequently point with accuracy to some form of discrimination, 
because of race, creed, color, or national origin. Frequently, we find it next to impossible to formulate a satisfactory answer to our critics in other countries. The gap between the things we stand for in principle and the facts of a particular situation may be too wide to be bridged. An atmosphere of suspicion and resentment in a country over the way a minority is being treated in the United States is a formidable obstacle to the development of mutual understanding and trust between the two countries. We will have better, we will have better international relations when these reasons for suspicion and resentment have been removed. I think it is quite obvious that the existence of discriminations against minority groups in the United States is a handicap in our relations with other countries. The Department of State, therefore, has good reason to hope that the continued and increased effectiveness of public and private efforts to do away with these discriminations. So while the NAACP report and the NC report are buried, I think they have an impact. And then we come to the petition most centrally uh, involving Paul Robes, and I should have mentioned that there are efforts to get in pet individual petitions before the United Nations. In 1949, uh, Du Bois submits a petition on behalf of some sharecroppers um, who have been uh, sentenced to execution by an all-white uh, segregation just, uh, Ku Klux Klan jury. Herbert Apthecker writes eloquently about this, so I won't go on about that, but in 1951, we have We Charge Genocide. And the central figures uh, are the Civil Rights Congress, which is the organization that puts together the petition, an organization that existed for about 10 years, 1946 to 1956, that really wanted to run against the mainstream of black African American leaders, which was to hitch our wagon to anti-communism. That is, uh, if we're going to be a part of this Cold War, then we've got to embarrass the U.S. in light of the Soviets, um, making the Soviets the bad guys. The Civil Rights Congress uh, thought that the anti-colonial struggle should be paramount and that we uh, shouldn't be uh, creating this divide. Uh, the Civil Rights Congress was led by uh, William Patterson. Paul Robeson was a central figure and took the petition to the United Nations. Uh, they were taking advantage of the creation of the Genocide Convention in 1948 by the United Nations. Once again, nations of color put the issue of genocide on the agenda. It was Panama, India, and Cuba who put genocide on the agenda in 48. By 1951, there were enough signatories for it to go into force. Uh, the United States signed it, but did not ratify it until 1988. Um, Robeson on the genocide petition. This is from New World Review, Genocide Stocks the USA, 1952. Out of the lessons of the barbarities of Nazi Germany, the voice of outraged mankind causes the General Assembly of the United Nations to adopt a convention on the prevention and punishment of the crime of genocide. The opening statement of this historic pet petition dispels the generally held misconception that the crime of genocide can be charged only when there is a mass extermination of a people. As defined in the United Nations Convention, genocide includes, quote, any of the following acts committed with the intent to destroy in whole or in part a national, ethnical, racial, or religious group. As such, A, in part, uh, A, killing members of the group, B, causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group, C, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its destruction in whole or in part. It is not difficult to understand why this convention has never been ratified by the Senate of the United States. This book, he's talking about We Charge Genocide, in fact reveals that a determined effort has been made by white supremacy to block U.S. signature. From the openly terrorist Ku Klux Klan to the more suave spokesman of the American Bar Association, there has been a brazenly open recognition of the applicability of the convention to the treatment of the Negro people in the United States. Once again, uh, the Civil Rights uh, uh, Convention, Civil Rights Congress petition uh, is buried in, in the UN bureaucracy. But I think the cumulative impact 
of these three conventions is indeed to internationalize the struggle for human rights in the United States. Indeed, it was not Malcolm X who does this in 64, 65, but 20 years earlier, we have some very brave people putting this on the line. It had some profound positive consequences and some negative consequences. Probably the most pronounced positive consequence that's referred to as the Brown decision. Uh, the Supreme Court was very concerned about international relations in rendering its Brown decision. If you read somebody's some case studies, like Richard Kluger's Simple Justice, uh, that's spelled out. Uh, probably the most pronounced negative uh, impact is what Robeson refers to, and that is the United States Senate refuses to ratify any human rights conventions. I mean, if black Americans are going to use these to embarrass us, let's not ratify them. So we have Brickerism and the threat of a Bricker Amendment, which leads Eisenhower to uh, make a deal not to ratify any of these conventions or covenants. Um, I want to I want to close by emphasizing all of that activity in the African American community, led by people like Robeson and Patterson, effective work from pressure on those going to the UN Charter meetings, right on up through the appeals to the Commission, and contrast that with today, and the real lack of any interest around international covenants, even though we've reached the point where we're finally ratifying. We've ratified the Genocide Convention, we've ratified the Torture Convention, we've ratified the Convention Against Racial Discrimination, and we've ratified the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Many of these speak very strongly to affirmative action, to the death penalty, to no any number of issues of concern to the African American community, uh, but there seems to be no domestic interest in using these documents at all. Uh, the Galele Report, a report on race and race discrimination in the United States done by the UN two or three years ago has received practically no press attention or attention on the part of domestic civil rights groups. Um, and finally, there's an individual petition process. Uh, each year at the UN Human Rights Commission meetings in Geneva, the United States is hauled before, well, I shouldn't say hauled before because it never reaches the floor. Uh, usually 80 or 90 petitions, an individual complaint or group complaint about human rights in the United States are presented. Generally, they fall into three categories, those around the rights of indigenous people, those around uh, the rights of political prisoners, uh, especially around Puerto Rican Black Panther prisoners, and those around prison conditions. Um, those petitions get virtually no attention from domestic press or from domestic civil rights groups. So, I'm going to turn it over to Ann Ginger, who I know will tell you about some ways in which we might generate some pressure on these issues. Thank you. Thank you. Since this, um, my friend Julianne Trailer mentioned that this is the 50th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and every month something's happening, and this is the February event, in July, we invite you all to an event in Berkeley. We're having a film festival in San Francisco and meetings in Berkeley with a double theme. The Cold War is over, right? So we're going to give honorable discharges to all the victims and veterans of the Cold War and the Vietnam War. Any of you entitled to an honorable discharge from those uh, times? You're welcome to come and participate. And we're also going to give registration papers for the 21st century. So. Uh, I heard Paul Robeson four times, and I went about it in the ordinary way the first two times. In 1943, I think it was, I bought a ticket in the ordinary way to go to see Othello. The effect, of course, was not ordinary. And then later, I bought a ticket in the ordinary way to listen in late, the late 40s in Cleveland. By then, I knew that Robeson was a great actor and singer and athlete, debater, lawyer, and a great orator. I had learned about his wife as Lenda Robeson, a great anthropologist, and I went to a concert where he said, in effect, or he said exactly, my ancestors in Africa reckon sound of major importance. They were all great talkers, great orators, and where writing was unknown, folk tales and an oral tradition 
kept the ears rather than the eyes sharpened. I am the same. I always hear. I seldom see. I hear my way through the world. I always judge by sound. And then he said something that amazed me. He said that there was a relationship between East African chants and Hasidic chants. Robeson begins. <clears throat> I'm about to do one that comes from the great tradition, which is the tradition of the black preacher. My father was a preacher, and when he felt very happy, he'd start what you call moving about. From this has grown much of the art that we listen to in any phase of our daily black American lives. Either of our preacher might have said, oh, the spirit said, I want you to go down that easy and bring my servant home. Oh, the spirit say, I want you. I want you to go down that easy and bring my servant home. Go down, go down. Preach my glory, my mighty name. I want you to go down. I want you to go down and bring my servant home. Oh, the spirit say, I want you. And he goes into a great chant. From the singing speech of the black preacher then, it becomes a great chant. And in searching for this, and following this back, we went back in Africa, and East Africa, and found some of these same forms that were in the African religious festival. Slotty balls globe, vive do chesky jebne. Slotty balls globe, vive do chesky jebne, jebne, je pala pala pata ye. One African chant comes from between the 13th and 15th centuries of the Czech plain chant. Why was this so? Because the Abyssinian church and the church of the Sudan were a part of the eastern churches of Byzantium. So they too had a music quite comparable to the music of the Near East. And to the music of the next one I shall do, one Hasidic chant of Rabbi Levi Isaac of Berdicha. Good day, dear Lord God Almighty. I, Levi Isaac, son of Sarah, from Berdicha. Here am I before thee with a grave and earnest plea for this thy people. What hast thou done to this thy people? Why hast thou so oppressed this thy people? Whoever suffers here against the sons of the oppressed, wherever sorrow here against the sons of the oppressed, whate'er betide, there is fight against the sons of the oppressed. On this earth, how many nations? The Romans, the Persians, the Babylonians, the English, what boast they? Our ruler is above all rulers. The German, what both say, our kingdom is above all kingdoms. But I, Levi Isaac, son of Sarah, from Berdicha declare, Vishgara, Vishgara, Shmaira, but I, Levi Isaac, son of Sarah, from Berdicha declare, I will not move from my place. From this place I will not move, and an end let there be to all this sowing and suffering. Vishgadal, Vishgadal, Shmarabo. I heard Paul Robeson two other times, but I didn't go in the ordinary way. Like Jim Herndon in Cleveland, Ohio in the late 40s, I went to a downtown Civic Center hall. Again, it was raining, and there was only one door open, and you could see that the police were taking your name and all the uh, license plate numbers as we walked in. And later in Cleveland, he, Paul Robeson did not sing downtown. He sang at 55th Street in the black neighborhood, or in the Negro neighborhood, as we would have said then. And in order to uh, get in, all the progressive-minded black and white people and trade unionists took the whole square and saw to it that no 
enemies came, including the police, and then we all walked into this church, and it was so full you weren't quite sure whether or not it would stand. Those were the four experiences I had in uh, hearing Paul Robeson directly. I'd like to talk about Paul Robeson having suffered, as he did, three years of going through law school in the United States in the early period when there was no pretense about its being anything other than a place to learn about how capitalist law is enforced. I'd like to talk about Robeson's role as a lawyer in the tradition of Nelson Mandela, Joe Slovo, and Fidel Castro, representing his people and all of the peoples before the United States government and the world's government, the UN. His path is clear, and so is the path of the UN General Assembly, and it, you will see the path of the United States. Charles Henry has gone over a, a good deal of this, but I'd like to put it in a somewhat different context. June 26th in 1945, in this city, the United Nations Charter was passed with the human rights sections enclosed. On October 25th, 1945, the very first act of the UN General Assembly was to condemn the threat or use of nuclear weapons, an issue on which Robeson, of course, talked and fought. In December of 46, as Charles Henry said, Truman issued an executive order establishing the President's Committee on Civil Rights. And today, incidentally, Professor Mary Frances Berry is the chair of that com uh, commission, and she's also head of KPFA, and a person who can be approached on any issue that you think should be raised by that commission. Then uh, Truman appointed his committee and they issued to secure these rights and in February 1948 in his address to Congress, Truman did ask Congress to pass a series of laws that would have improved the civil rights condition in the United States. Those laws were not passed. Then in December 9th, 1948, the day before, the day we talk about December 10th, December 9th, the UN General Assembly adopted the Genocide Convention. And it was the next day that the UN adopted the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And then the new era came. And in, as you know, in June 1950, war so-called broke out between North Korea and South Korea. On June 28th, Paul Robeson spoke in Madison Square Garden before 18,000 people in a meeting called by the Civil Rights Congress to protest the U.S. involvement in the Korean Peninsula. One of the speakers was Congressman Vito Mark Antonio of New York. In July, Robeson then, the same year, 51, next year, appealed to the United States, to the UN ambassador to the UN, to negotiate a five-power peace treaty in Korea and to give China its rightful place in the United Nations. Neither of these events took place. And it was in the December of that year that Paul Robeson in New York and William L. Patterson in Paris gave to the United Nations the petition called We Charge Genocide. As it the goal was to get this document to the Economic and Social Council of the United Nations and to the Human Rights Commission. Patterson's passport was lifted while he was in Paris. The United States government was so afraid of this act. On December 14th, uh, I'm sorry, Ju on, then on June 12th, 1956, Paul Robeson was called before the House on American Activities Committee, which was investigating unauthorized use of passports. And Robeson, in answer to a question, said, I would say in Russia I felt for the first time like a full human being, and no color prejudice like in Mississippi, and no color prejudice like in Washington. And it was the first time I felt like a human being, where I did not feel the pressure of colored as I feel in this committee today. Why do you not stay in Russia, said the committee attorney. Because my father was a slave and my people died to build this country. And I am going to stay here and have a part of it, just like you. And no fascist-minded people will drive me from it. Is that clear? I am for peace with the Soviet Union and I am for peace with China 
and I am not for peace or friendship with the fascist Franco. And a little toward the end of his testimony, this interchange took place. The chair said, do you know Ben Davis? One of my dearest friends, one of the finest Americans you can imagine, born of a fine family who went to Amherst and was a great man. At this time, uh, Benjamin Davis, a leader of the Communist Party, was an elected member of the City Council of New York City for many years. The answer is yes, and a very great friend, and nothing could make me prouder than to know him. The chairman, that answers the question. The attorney, did I understand you to laud his patriotism? I say that he is as patriotic and American as there can be. And you gentlemen belong with the Alien and Sedition Act. And you are the non-patriots. And you are the un-Americans. And you ought to be ashamed of yourselves. <laughs> the chairman, just a minute. The hearing is now adjourned. I should think it would be. I have endured all of this that I can. Can I read my statement? No, you cannot read it. The meeting is adjourned. I think it should be, and you should adjourn, the, adjourn it forever. That's what I say. <laughs> that was 1956. In 19, December 14, 1960, the UN issued a declaration, that means the General Assembly, on the granting of independence to colored peoples. November 1963, the General Assembly issued a declaration on the elimination of all forms of racial discrimination. The General Assembly, as you know, it's not like the Security Council, but it's as much a part of the UN. And in the General Assembly, each nation has an equal vote. And the United States and other colonial powers have been outvoted repeatedly. So there were two then, the Declaration of Human Rights and the Declaration on the Granting of Independence of the Colored People and the Declaration on the Elimination of All Forms of racial discrimination. In 1965, Paul Robeson came back to the United States, having lost his passport in the meantime and then gained it back. And he said, it's good to be back in 1965. The struggle for freedom now in the South and all over this land is a struggle uniting many sections of the American people, as evidenced in the Great March from Selma to Montgomery where thousands of black and white citizens of this country marched for the freedom of our people in the Deep South and for a new kind of America. Also uniting many sections of our people is the struggle for peace, this demand to avoid any chance of nuclear war rather than to live in peace and friendship. This was evidenced by the recent march to the United Nations and the Students' March on Washington. Most important is the recognition that achieving these demands in no way lessens the democratic rights of white American citizens. On the contrary, it will enormously strengthen the base of democracy for all Americans. Then in 1966, the UN issued the International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination. And as Charles said, it took three years for the, it to become law with enough nations having ratified it. President Johnson signed this document, September 1966, for the United States and sent it to the Senate, where it sat for a very long time. In April 1978, the UN Special Committee Against Apartheid paid tribute to Paul Robeson for his work in that effort. In 1988, the US ratified the Genocide Convention. And then, in a unique move, of which we have done, about which we've done nothing, the Congress passed a law called the Genocide Convention Implementation Act. Everything Charles read you is now a crime under the US government. Anyone who commits direct public incitement to genocide is committing a crime. There is no instance in which any US attorney since 1988 has used this law I'm sure they never heard of it. Maybe some of us in this room will do something about that. In 1994, the Senate then ratified the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination, which 
the President Johnson had signed, and none of the media, including KQED, KPFA, or the local press, ever mentioned the fact that that treaty was ratified. Now, I'd like to make clear, when you call it a convention, it is still a document. It, it doesn't, in this case, mean a meeting. And in 1944, as Charles Henry mentioned, a person was appointed by the UN, and this is done by consensus, and it took years to get them to agree, but the UN decided that the UN Special Rapporteur on Contemporary Forms of Racism, Xenophobia, and Anti-Semitism should be sent to study the United States, and he made such a study, and it's a bitter attack and urge, a statement urging the United States to take many steps forward. So I believe, friends, Seldom can you see as clear a path as this in the actions of an individual, Paul Robeson, and in the actions of an organization, the United Nations General Assembly. And slowly, unwillingly, you do see forward steps even by the United States President and Congress. Now, this convention on the elimination of all forms of racial discrimination, I want to explain, it's a treaty. That's what it is. And it was ratified by the Senate like any other treaty, like NAFTA or GATT or any other treaty. And it is part of the supreme law of the United States and has been since 1994. And it defines racial discrimination very clearly and very broadly. Quote, any distinction, exclusion, restriction, or preference based on race, color, descent, or national or ethnic origin, which has the purpose or effect of limiting the exercise on an equal footing of human rights and fundamental freedoms in all fields of public life. Now, the US government made four commitments when it ratified this treaty. Not everything, but they did four. That they would publicize the text. I mean, that means publicize broadly, top to bottom in this country, all across the federal system. That has not been done. A previous human rights treaty, they did a huge job of publicizing. Namely, they sent two copies to every state, one to the governor, one to the attorney general. And you can imagine what happened in Sacramento as a result of that. They agreed to publicize the text. They agreed to prepare an accurate and complete report on racial discrimination in the United States every two years. They agreed to submit the report to the UN Committee on uh, Racial Discrimination, which meets in Geneva. And they agreed to go to Geneva and send government officials to meet with the UN Committee to dialogue, to discuss steps the United States government should take to end discrimination. Now, to dispel your cynicism about these matters, the people on the UN committees are not ambassadors. They do not represent governments. They're honest-minded scholars. The United States would never appoint Dr. Apthecker, but other countries have appointed people like Dr. Apthecker, lawyers, scholars, to be on the committee, and they vote and speak for themselves, not for their governments. And when the US person sits there and U.S. is coming up, the U.S. person says nothing. This is not nothing, friends. This reporting process actually works. 32 out of 38 countries that have gone through the reporting process more than once have changed their actual laws. Both Canada and Australia have changed their laws in their treatment of indigenous peoples as a result of going through this process. We all need to tell Clinton now that we expect him to immediately order the State Department to complete the first U.S. report and submit it to the U.N. Committee. The first report was due November 20, 1995. The second U.S. report was due November 20, 1997. Neither report has been filed to date. When I asked Congressman Dellums to write Clinton a letter, which he did, he got no answer. We need to tell the media to publicize the text and their duty to let everyone know about this treaty. Now, there is a value for us in the Bay Area because at the first report can be only at the national level. Thereafter, they have to be at the local level. The city and county of San Francisco is eventually going to have to file a report with the U.S. to go to the U.N on every aspect of denials of, of ra racial equality, every aspect of racial discrimination in the city and county. And I should tell you in Berkeley, where I sit on the Berkeley City Commission of Peace and Justice, we made such a report to the US government 
from our Labor Commission, our Women's Commission, and our Youth Commission. You could do it now. You could get Sue Bierman or whoever else, Amiano, I'm not a San Francisco person, whoever, Willie Brown, he knows how to read the UN documents. We could become a UN city and we could be the first in the country to write a report on the, con the situation of racial discrimination in this city and county based on this covenant. Micklejohn Institute is working hard in the to make issue sheets, and I have some with me, I'll show you later, to submit first to the US State Department for them to include in their report, and then if they don't include them, we submit them directly to the UN Committee. And we know from our experience with a previous human rights treaty that they will use them. They'll, put, they'll take your piece of paper and ask the US government about this. In the spirit, if not the voice of Paul Robeson, I ask you to help us collect facts and reports on any example of racial discrimination that you know of anywhere in the United States. And if you find a good example of doing the right thing, we want that as well. And we have issue sheets you're welcome to use. We need your help in collecting these facts because the U.S. report will not be accurate, nor will it be complete, and it will not be poignant. It will not make clear how people actually feel at this time. The U.S., just to be clear about the treaty, the language of the U.N. is not the limited language of the U.S. about civil and political rights. It cuts deep. This treaty specifically requires a country to take measures. That means affirmative action, spelled out, requires to develop and protect any racial group to guarantee them the full and equal enjoyment of human rights and fundamental freedoms. And it explicitly says that affirmative action is not a violation of human rights as long as the group be, that is being helped has been discriminated against. And that's a commitment that the US government made to make a report on that subject. To declare any act of violence a punishable offense, that is hate crimes, to declare any incitement to racial discrimination and any provision of any government assistance to racist activities a punishable offense, to guarantee security and protection by the government against any violence or bodily harm, that's police misconduct. And then there are a series of things we don't think of as human rights because in this country we don't have them, but in the international field they are assumed to guarantee no racial or ethnic discrimination in enjoyment of the right to work, thank you, the right to housing, the right to public health, medical care, social security, and social services. These in the UN system are considered rights that are to be fought for now. And under this treaty, the US must report whether or not it's doing these things. To assure, I'm quoting, to assure the right to seek just and adequate reparation or satisfaction for any damage suffered as a result of such discrimination. So those people who are seeking reparations for the conditions under slavery, just cite Article 6. To adopt immediate and effective measures to combat prejudices and to promote understanding, tolerance, and friendship among nations and racial or ethnical groups. Now please note, the government did not agree to do all of these things. They agreed to report on what they have done and failed to do and to ensure such each right. And we know that when the world community looks at the United States, as we learn to look at South Africa, South Africa changed. And if all of us would decide to get over our cynicism about the UN, which is based on what the US does in the Security Council, and to look at the UN in which the Security Council is only one part, the Economics and Social Council is very different. The General Assembly is very different. The International Court of Justice has been different on many occasions. And the Secretary General is not in our pocket. So those of us who are cynical about the UN are cynical about the Security Council. These other aspects, we have an opportunity to be active in. I know I sound like a preacher, but then again, Paul Robeson's father was a preacher, and maybe it's appropriate on certain occasions. Uh, so what we are saying is that it is effective to put things on a piece of paper, to count the number of black churches that have been burned, to count the number of synagogues that have been trashed, to count the number of swastikas. The only way we ever decided AIDS was important was by counting the number of people who had it. If we counted the number of people who have racism, a disease, what, who are affected by it in this country, it will have, I think, a powerful effect. So we have the issue, we have these we have this, what, more or less what I've said here is here. We have a copy of the, um, 
Genocide Convention Implementation Act here. You can get copies of these later from the, uh, in the other room. And we have copies of the issue sheets. So on this El Nino February day in 1998, as the U.S. threatens war in Iraq, let us all join hands in the spirit of Paul Robeson and Aslanda Robeson and commit ourselves to do all in our power to keep the U.S. government from bombing Iraq, to force the government to carry out its commitments to the peoples of the United States and the world, to report violations of the rights of the African American people and all people of color in the United States and the U.S. territories and its actions all over the world, and to take affirmative action to right these wrongs. Thank you. My name is Shashi. I'm with the Paul Robeson Society. I'd like to ask you, can Bill Clinton, who signed the Pledge of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, can he be charged under the Genocide Convention if he decides to kill babies in Iraq? Well, the Genocide Convention does not provide let me start over again. The difficulty of bringing charges against an individual at the moment, like the president of a country, is very great. And we've seen the difficulties at the moment because we don't have an international criminal court, which is now being proposed. But I'm not sure that that is the end of the matter at all. I believe that the people of the United States can stop Clinton, even now, from taking such action. Apparently, the Senate and the House are adjourned, so he's got no support. Frankly, folks, I think if we all got together with Senator Boxer and Senator Feinstein and they started raising a little sand about this, we would be somewhere. And you should know that last Tuesday, I convinced the Berkeley City Council to pass an ordinance, a resolution opposing US actions in Iraq. And we are going to have a public, uh, this is a separate subject in Robeson, so I didn't mention it, but we're having a public meeting a week from today in Berkeley at the North Berkeley Senior Center at 3.30, called by the City Council of the City of Berkeley to demand that Clinton not go to war with Iraq because it violates all parts of U.S. law. I think that condemnation of Clinton in the General Assembly is as effective as any kind of legalistic thing that could be done. An individual cannot be brought before the world court and to, you have to have a special vote to set up a special committee like the Nuremberg trials or the trials now about Yugoslavia. So I think a much more effective thing, it's much easier than that, is each of you to call Boxer and Feinstein, who are Democrats in the same party as Clinton, and saying you flatly disapprove of this illegal action of going to war without a vote of Congress, of going to war when we have not been attacked, of violating the whole UN Charter. I, I don't want to get off too much on this, but there are flyers on the back that list all of the legal grounds for this uh, disapproval of the U.S. proposed actions in Iraq. And I hope that you all will contact your council members in supervisors in San Francisco to get them to pass a resolution, tell your friends all across the country. I think a great deal can be done. You're welcome to come use the microphone right here, or you can come up here if you like. Or if you want to stay in your seat, if you just um, call out your question, then I'll repeat it here at the microphone. So any other questions or comments? Yes. Uh, any comments on uh, OK. Did, do you hear that? Any comments on Clinton's dialogue on race? I'm all for it. <laughs> the more we discuss it, the better. I know the chairman very well. It's John Hope Franklin. And uh, he's a man of great uh, principle, great honor. Uh, he's therefore having some trouble on the commission. But he's also a man of courage. Uh, the more this uh, question is discussed, uh, the more it is confronted, the better. 
uh, I was at the uh, meeting held in uh, San Jose uh, yesterday, I think it was, the day before. John Hope was there and chaired it. And uh, it was a vigorous meeting with important information, significant complaints. And I know that uh, John Hope not only listened, but uh, he has devoted his life uh, to the struggle against racism now, what power he actually has, of course, I don't know. But he was appointed by the president as the chairperson of this commission. It is traveling around the country. It's on its way to Denver. And uh, such discussions are good. I'm not at all cynical about this. There's no other way uh, uh, right now except to support this effort. And I have great uh, confidence in John Hope Franklin uh, and his committee. Nothing ex but good can come out of it. Uh, so uh, I call it to your attention. Go ahead. Well, I, I am cynical about uh, reports on uh, race and race relations because we have so many of them. Um, and, and so you want to ask why one more? Uh, so I was a bit suspicious going in, but I'm a former student of John Hope Franklin's, and uh, like Professor Apthecker, I think he's a man of great principle and integrity and a very difficult man to pull into something that uh, uh, would be uh, purely um, symbolic. So I have some hope that indeed something positive and productive might come out of the Franklin uh, Commission. But I have to tell you what I call a joke. I called up the commission the minute I discovered it existed, and I found the right person to talk to. And I said, of course you realize that the United States has ratified the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination, and that we have a report due to the UN. And you're, I'm sure your commission will work on this. And do you know, no one in that office had ever heard of the Convention on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. So I faxed them a copy, and I have not heard from them since. So I believe it is essential that all of us get clear. We have the US Constitution. We have the Bill of Rights. We have the 14th Amendment. There is no wall between the US and the responsibility under the 14th Amendment and the UN Charter and the conventions. You walk back and forth. Once a treaty is adopted, it's part of the supreme law of the land. And if you folks in this audience can comprehend what I've just said, you're a lot better than most of the lawyers I know who either do international law or constitutional law. They can't weld them together, which Paul Robeson absolutely stood for, and did Nelson Mandela and Joe Slovo. And it seems to me that it is our, your duty to learn this so simple fact that we ratified a convention on the elimination of all forms of race. It's a treaty, just like NAFTA and GATT. They, Congress has learned that. They can learn this and that this commission has a responsibility to include within its discussion the enforcement, the reporting requirements under this treaty. There's a question right here. Yes. Oh. Just below the mic. I think I can be heard. OK, go ahead. Uh, I would like to hear you folks say something kind about our president had the guts to create this commission at a time when he's under fire by the right-wingers and the media in our country. Would you like to do that? Sure. I have many issues. Clinton signed the Convention on the Elimination of the Rights of the Child, and I commend him for it. Clinton signed the, um, he didn't, he signed two of, oh, he s signed the, uh, he said that the Congress that the Senate should uh, complete ratification of the Convention on the Elimination of All dis Forms of Discrimination Against Women. He encouraged the uh, ratification of the uh, Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty. Every time Clinton does a good thing, I support it. Every time he doesn't do something that I think he should do, I can criticize it, and I also criticize others. The, I don't know how many of you have been to Washington. It is another country. They don't hear from us. They talk to each other. They talk to the media in Washington. 
I'm hoping one year that all of us go to Washington, all of us, in September when they're passing the budget and stay there all month and get the kind of budget we need. If they hear from us, including Clinton, if he hears from us, he will move. He doesn't hear from us. The left, the liberals, the progressives have not learned to do political action in the, coming, in the recent period the way the right wing does. They shut us up in the Cold War and we have not gotten our act together since that time to take firm, clear, loud positions. And if we pushed Clinton in the direction we believe in, I am convinced he would go in that direction. Okay, the person in the front here and then in the back there. I'd like to say a word. Oh, I excuse may. me. Go ahead, Dr. Aptuka. I agree with what my colleague has I agree with what my colleague has just said. Uh, I would like to add my thought. Uh, there is, in my opinion, a serious right-wing conspiracy against the Clinton administration. I am convinced that this has been carefully prepared. It is very well financed. It has unlimited funds. Uh, the most of the press is corrupt or corrupted. Uh, most of the means of communication, television, for instance, also. Uh, Clinton is in a very difficult position, and so is Mrs. Clinton. I am myself persuaded that this is an orchestrated very serious, right-wing, fascist-inclined effort to overturn the results of the recent presidential elections and to prepare the next election with a extreme right-wing candidate in power. I think this is a very serious matter. I don't think I have illusions about the president, but he is fundamentally, in my opinion, and so is she, what we call in this country a liberal Democrat. And this is infinitely preferable to the Speaker of the House and to those who finance uh, the extreme right, and they have unlimited funds. Uh, they have dangerous backgrounds in our country. Uh, religious hatreds, racial hatreds, all, uh, all sorts of possibilities of moving towards an American version of fascism. This is growing. This is serious. And uh, we should react to it. Now, I want to recommend two pages in the current issue of The Nation magazine the one that reached my home today. I don't know what the date is, but it's the one that's just out. And it has a two-page presentation of the facts of the history of a campaign against the Clinton administration financed by tens of millions of dollars, which has begun uh, for the past several years and is now at a high point. Do examine the current nation and those two pages. Be aware that we are facing a most serious uh, danger uh, and that we must resist it. And for heaven's sakes, we must be back of the creation of some left organization, some left voice, some left medium, some left propaganda outfit, something wh which will call this reality, this, re this very serious reality, to as many people as we can. I believe that this country faces a pro-fascist coup. I say this with all responsibility. 
I believe it faces a pro-fascist coup financed by hundreds of millions of dollars. And that's how serious this situation is. Do examine the current Nation magazine, those two pages, and act, 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 and talk to your friends and to your family and to the people you know. This is a very serious moment in the history of our country. All right. Wait, the person right down here and then back there. Did everyone hear what she said? Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm willing to speak first to my good friend. I don't agree with you. The Article 2.1 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights is explicit, and I think beautiful. And please listen to the words that they say there can be no distinction as to. I know that's a bad sentence. And I'm going to, in this hand, I'm going to say the ones that are in the U.S. Constitution, and in this hand, I'm going to say the ones that are just in the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. And this is a document that the United States has ratified. We're supposed to obey it, just like the racial discrimination. And in making their list, this is people all over the world, and this is the list they made. No distinction based on race, sex, color, language, re race, sex, color, language, religion, political or other opinion, national or social origin, property, birth, or other status. And they have said other status includes disability, disabilities and includes sexual preference. And in their list, you notice they specifically say no distinction based on property. And all through the UN documents, when they're talking human rights, they say civil and political, and economic, social, and cultural, and you cannot have one without the other, explicitly. I believe that it is helpful to say the whole list. I think it takes time. I think it takes energy, just like now we have to say African American, Hispanic, Latino, Pacific Islanders. You know, you can't just, it isn't easy anymore. Well, good. I mean, we learn, we talk about the diaspora, and any Jewish person knows there's a difference between the, the Jewish from the Western Europe and from the Eastern Europe, and so on, so on, so It's not difficult if you just decide we're all sisters and brothers. When I was in Cape Town last year, and I discovered that the new South African Constitution, which is a thing of beauty and a joy forever, and I hope you all read it, they have 12 official languages. Everyone is the brother of everyone else, and everybody feels that way. So that I personally believe that it does not dilute what's wrong, and I think it's basic, and we've all sort of played around with it. McCarthyism won. That's why we don't have the kind of movement that Dr. Apthecker is talking about today. They shut us up. They fired us. Some people committed suicide. Some people got scared. Some people moved to the country and, and shut their minds, and they threw away their books. Well, it's over. The Cold War is over. We need to get up with our banners. We need to tell Senator, we have two senators, two U.S. senators with two votes. We have a lot of Congress members. They don't hear from us on these issues. When I've talked to Boxer, she hadn't even heard of these treaties. We need to get acquainted with all of the administrative aides to all of the Congress members and senators and let them know every day what's going on. I'll tell you one quick joke. My brother lives in Fort Collins, brother-in-law in Fort Collins, 
and he started a campaign one day with his senator, and he made six phone calls, and by the sixth phone call, the person on the other end of the line said, there seems to be a campaign. Well, if he can do it, one person in Fort Collins, all of us, if, if, I mean, we have really not committed ourselves to daily political action. And I agree with everything that was just said about Clinton. It is also true, if he drops bombs on Iraq, that is a violation of the Constitution, it is a violation of the UN Charter, it is a violation of human rights, and it will cause, will not accomplish one single affirmative thing except ensuring a bigger budget for the military, and U.S. service people will die in addition to many Iraqis and people elsewhere. So we have a double problem, and the military is determined. They're taking this moment, in my opinion, when Clinton is in difficulty on other things, to push him to agree to a, an absolutely improper action. Okay, the question here, and unfortunately, this will have to be the last question, and we're going to go into Charles the... Wants to, Charles wants to... Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. I, I appreciate your, your concern uh, with the term. I think it's like any term that enters public discourse. It's a matter of uh, who has control of the media, et cetera, in terms of how you define it. Um, there's a lot of concern about hate speech and, and discussion on college campuses and laws passed. And the first people brought in uh, charged with hate speech were black students who were calling white students' names rather than vice versa. Um, so uh, I, I think, once again, it gets sort of back to our theme of, well, who's, who's going to define the terms we use? There's a, there's a very superficial definition of multiculturalism that some call sort of cafeteria culture where we have, you know, uh, once a week we have uh, Latino food and we have African food, so forth, and we, we do that and we think that's multiculturalism and our students now are sensitive and knowledge about, knowledgeable about other cultures. And there's a much more substantive multiculturalism that I think Anne is talking about that indeed is a, is a very positive concept. Um, I am concerned that some of the terms that were important in the 60s, like racial justice, have been excised from uh, sort of the public sphere and discourse and sidetracked into things like color blindness. Um, and once again, those are, are battles that have to be fought simply by saying we're not going to use the term um, color blindness or, or uh, multiculturalism doesn't, doesn't really solve the problem. Only, only activism does, and re relating to the, the question about Clinton, which um, you know, I, I can't feel uh, uh, totally negative about Clinton since he's appointed me to a couple of commissions and so forth. Uh, uh, people don't get rewarded for support for human rights uh, in Congress. You know, if you've got a big contribution to make, you get access, or if you can deliver votes. Well, no congressperson, boxer, Feinstein, uh, uh, don't know about these bills because no one is defeated, right, uh, based on a, a human rights issue, what we define as a human rights issue. So unless we get out there and put some pressure on Clinton is, is penalized for supporting human rights, but not rewarded in any way. When we did the, I, I was in the State Department when we did the preface to the first report on civil and political rights in the United States, which came out in 94. And uh, we were immediately accused by the right wing of a wonderful term I've never heard before, Midge Dector, who didn't read the whole report. She read the preface. We asked her if she wanted to read the whole report. She said no. She had already written her, her editorial for, for um, the national interest or something like that. But she accused uh, uh, John Shattuck and the State Department of spiritual greed. And I always thought that was an interesting term, spiritual greed. So um, I think that's, uh, you know, a, a new definition for idealism. So we were accused of being greedy and wanting to take uh, human rights in, in, in places. I, I, I suppose it wasn't supposed to go. But we were immediately hammered for, for that report, and there was very little positive response. So there's not much incentive to keep going and ratifying the treaties and doing the reports uh, if people out there aren't, um, aren't listening. I'd like to say a word. If I may. Go ahead. Uh, I agree with something that I think was in the mind of the woman who spoke. That this uh, multicultural 
language uh, tends to dilute uh, militant struggle. I think it does. And I think there is a deliberate uh, use of that coinage. Uh, another, a, a fa the fact is that the most significant and most awful oppression is of the African American population. Uh, historically, uh, this is it. That's its root. And uh, that is its basic uh, or its most important force today. And uh, this multicultural approach dilutes that. It, it tends to take the eye away from that. Right. We have to get our eyes back on that. Uh, the basic thing in this country still is the scandalous oppression of the African American population. Uh, and, 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 and it is this uh, scandalous, this atrocious uh, policy uh, which seeks to criminalize the Afro-American population so that a significant proportion of the youth uh, are in prison or about to, to go to prison. Or they're dead. Uh, now, uh, and the whole propaganda about this is racist. It's fundamentally racist. I'd like to make a point about my experience. You know, I went to Hanoi when you weren't supposed to go, and when it was illegal. And I uh, went with Stort Lind and uh, Tom Hayden. Tom Hayden now is a distinguished uh, person, so he, he doesn't want to remember that, and he has nothing to do with Aptek. That's another matter. But the three of us went. Uh, I did it. I organized it. We went against the law. Uh, and that's a long story. But, but one of the points I want to make is that when I was there, the comrades in Hanoi took me to their revolutionary museum. And one of the features of that museum was the effort of the French to criminalize their youth and to and, in addition to that, uh, to fill them with dope, <laughs> with dope, uh, with narcotics. I was very impressed with the similarity of the, of the, of the effort made by the French to maintain their domination uh, through this uh, uh, propaganda, you see, uh, through criminalizing the youth uh, and uh, to uh, neutralize them in terms of narcotics. They had a whole wall showing this, and it was very serious, that this was one of the fundamental means by which the French sought for decades to maintain their power in this uh, colony. And I believe an analogous situation exists today in the United States. But, but there is a difference between being against multiculturalism, as you've both said, and objecting to the UN treaties making a list. It isn't multicultural, it's specific. So I think there's a difference between attacking multiculturalism, as you've both been discussing, and supporting the specific lists of non-discrimination in the UN treaties and using the word human rights to include all of them, which specifically includes economic rights and specifically race. I think that there is a difference, and I support the second, the list. And I agree with what you've been saying about the phrase multiculturalism or the use. Turn around so they can get you on television. Oh, well, that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I saw this thing on television the other night. I, I, I differ with you, Ed. 
There's something uh, that's not quite right trying to make all of these things equal. There's something historically different. You can't ignore it. Okay. And you're ignoring that. No. The, other, the only thing I wanted to say, and I know time is of the essence, I saw this program the other night on television about the suicide rate among Native American youth. And I was almost of the opinion, they are in a worse shape than we black folk are. Yeah. Now, there's something different about that than, than all of these Asians and other people who come in and say, we're all being victimized by color. That's not quite true. It's not, it's not only, um, it's not only it was, that, that's oh. true, but I want to make the point that this business dilutes, dilutes the central target. And the central target, historically and currently, is the special oppression of the African American population. This is the heart of our history. Well, and I urge you to use the section about reparations, which is in the UN document. And for them to drag their feet and not enforce the law is something I cannot forgive them. My, my, friend, my friend, I want to say something to what you just said. Uh, there's much truth, of course, in what you said. But the, the point is, for example, FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, was a conservative governor of New York. In his first administration, he had a conservative cabinet. Several of them were Republicans. What produced the change? A mass movement. A mass movement. When we developed that, when millions got into the what became the CIO and the National Negro Congress and the, and the Negro Movement and so on, and the youth movement, uh, that took about uh, two or three months or four months and you began to see a change in the president's stance, in his speeches, and finally, after about six or seven months, in his actions. He dismissed, for instance, Woodin, who was a Republican Secretary of the Treasury. He threw him out of his cabinet. This is very significant. Of course the president has enormous power, but it's not omnipotence. The president is a politician. He has executive power. There is a legislature and so on. It is our duty to mobilize forces to educate the, the president to force him uh, to move. Right. I believe, this is very important, that we have a president whom we can force. We have such a president. This is not Ronald Reagan. Right. This is not Ronald Reagan. Or George Bush. And it is our duty to force him in the direction in which we want him to move. And this can be accomplished. It has been accomplished in the past. And this moment is a very serious moment because the right is highly organized, has the press, has television, has unlimited wealth, and is miseducating the population of the United States. And anyone who is of the left has a duty to resist this by all means to resist it, to, to get your friends, to write your letters, to organize yourselves, to begin to think in your head of how serious this is. We are at a moment where people like the Speaker of the House would welcome a fascist country. Now, that's a very serious thing. And it's something new in our country. And we, who meet here and have the concerns that we have, have to act. And the point of such action is the intolerable special oppression of the African-American population, which is scandalous. I must, def I must defer to the esteemed professor here, and then Julianne Trailer will close the program. Dr. Apsiker called our attention to an article, and a magnificent uh, article it is, 
um, which, well, I want you to hear me as much as look at me, and I'm not interested in the camera. <laughs> in that article that Dr. Aftaker called our attention to, I want to call your attention to the New Yorker magazine, uh, February's edition, the attorney and journalist, Tubin, who I think you probably know a great deal about, it relates to, he did a lot of reporting on the OJ trial. And in his article, he calls attention to um, the fact that Howard Smith, Judge Howard Smith, uh, back in 1964, the Civil Rights uh, Bill that came up. I want you to read it for yourself and get the full flavor of it. But in that article, Judge uh, Smith thought it would be appropriate as a matter of tactic and strategy to introduce the word sex into the Civil Rights Bill. Now, you might also want to read Lewis Clayton Jones' book called Enough is Enough, who's another great attorney from, from uh, uh, Yale University, in which he uh, simply states that the termination of the Civil Rights Movement, the so-called Black Movement of the 60s, ended when they ratified uh, Howard Smith's amendment to the Civil Rights Act, which was the addition of sex. It was introduced as a joke, and it was introduced as a tactic to, uh, in a sense, dilute. And I think the way that the uh, lady mentioned uh, in her converse, uh, conversation or question or statement, which she asked for comments from the panel, multiculturalism was talking about tactics and strategies. No one's opposed to multiculturalism. But there are certain tactics and strategies that can be effective, and there are certain mechanisms that are employed from time to time to simply dilute or, in another way of speaking, evaporize and get you off the key subject. The key subject at that point, the time in history in 1964, was about the black movement. You have heard almost nothing since then. Since 1964 Civil Rights Act, no major piece of legislation Immediately, the concern became a wide range of other interests. Now, if we are, are, uh, can be in agreement that the, 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 the crisis that this country faces is a crisis that it emanates from slavery, that economically, politically, and socially, that economically, uh, certainly, deprivation is most manifested in the black community, that socially, the degradation is most manifested in the African community, and that politically impotence is most manifested in the African community, then you got your tactic and you got your strategy. If you sincerely want to resolve the question, if you lift those who are furthest down, you'll benefit. We should give our panelists and the other participants here a great round of applause. And, and they have all called us to educate. And in just this forum that we've had here this afternoon, I'm sure we've all learned something. And in the context of celebrating the centenary of Paul Robeson's birth, and the 50th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, we've met some of our initial goals in terms of public education in FAR that we have here. In terms of organizing here, let me mention one of the events in, um, in May. We're going to be discussing economic, social, and cultural human rights. We're going to be discussing hunger, health, immigration, labor issues. We are going to have a hearing over at the federal building in Oakland on May the 2nd. I want you all to write that down in your calendars. We'll have people from the congressional delegation here, representatives of the trade unions, other labor unions, um, health officials, um, health providers, um, educators, and what have you, coming to testify at that particular hearing in Oakland on May, the on May the 2nd, where we will talk about adopting a fairness agenda as a political agenda, an organizing tool. There will be a hearing also in Washington, D.C. in September on these same issues. So we're talking about educating, we're talking about um, 
uh, publicizing these events. We're talking about organizing. And so I thank you all, and I, and I invite you all to participate in further activities in this year-long celebration or a year-long assessment of human rights here in the Bay Area. There's information here. You're free to contact us at the Amnesty International office here in San Francisco, area code 415-291-9233. If you want any additional information of, about um, human rights and the Human Rights Year and this celebration. And thank you all for coming.